Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to uh, construct a frequency table and frequency histogram um, using the president data example that we have in the week two material. Uh, to access that uh, president example, if you go to learning modules and click on your week two material, you'll see you have a menu, a bunch of menu items up here. Uh, the example is here. It says example U.S. presidents. It's a PDF and you can print it out. So there it is. Um, looking at this data, I can see that right here, that's Obama right there. Um, I'm missing Trump, so I'll have to add him in. So I've opened this already in OneNote so I could write on it. So let me start by putting Trump at the end here. Uh, Trump was actually 70 at inauguration. All right, so let's look at the first part. It says construct the frequency table and frequency histogram of the data, and it says use six classes. Now, that's actually two different things. So we're going to first construct a frequency table, and then afterwards we'll use the frequency table to construct the histogram. Now, remember the histogram um, is a bar graph that's used to depict uh, continuous data types. So let's do the frequency table first. So the frequency table, remember what it does is it organizes your data into these intervals that we call classes, along with how many pieces of data fall in each class, and that is called frequency. Now, when you look at this data, this data is out of order, of course. Now, in an earlier video, I showed you how to input this data into your calculator and how to sort it. And I've already done that because I did it in an earlier video. So here it is. It's in order. Um, as you can see, when you look at this data, um, the youngest president at inauguration was 42 years old. So when I come here, my first class will start at 42. And then we'll run to an upper class boundary. All right, so now what we do before we start, you know, to construct these classes, we have to find how wide the classes are going to be. And remember, that uses this thing called the class width formula. So the class width formula is defined. It's actually the range, which is the highest piece of data, subtract the lowest piece of data. And you divide that by the number of classes. This result, when we get it, remember, will be rounded up. So the class width, the highest piece of data, which is 70. Subtract the lowest piece of data. That's here. That's this 42-year-old. Divided by the number of classes, and it tells us use six classes. So we will divide by six. All right, so we could run to our calculator really quick. And perform this computation. So 70 subtract 42. Make sure that's in parentheses. And divide that by six. All right, so they have it 4.6 repeating. So this answer is 4.6 repeating. And remember, the rule for the class width, no matter what your decimal is, is you have to round up. Now, a lot of people would say, well, we would have to round that up anyway, because, you know, there was a, a 0.6. And, you know, um, when you have a, a decimal of 0.6, we would round that up to 5. But even if that class width worked out to be something like, say, 4.2, we would still round that up to 5. Round up means no matter what you get for your decimal, you round up to the next whole number. All right, so that's our class width. So what does that do for us? Well, that tells us how far apart the uh, consecutive lower class limits and upper class limits are. So in other words, if the, the first class is going to start at this 42 right here, the next lower class limit is going to be 5 away. So what we do is we take that 5 and we add it to the 42 and we'll get 47. And then we keep repeating this process until we create six lower class limits. So 42 plus 5 is 47 plus 5 is 52 plus 5 57 62 67 so I've can I've created six lower class limits all right so now what well now what about the upper class limits well think about it if this particular class right here if this class started at 47, by common sense, this class here must have ended at 46. Now, you could also, you know, 
count on your fingers, 42, 43, 44, 45, and 46, that takes care of five pieces of data, which, you know, lets you know the class with being five. All right, and once you have that upper class limit for this first class being 46, then obviously all you need to do is add five straight down. So 46 plus five is 51 and 56. So all I'm doing here is adding five, 61, 66, 71. You put your first, your lowest piece of data, add five straight down. You find your upper limit for that by common sense, add five straight down. All right, so now what? Well, now we have to figure out the frequency of this data. So now we need to know how many pieces of data in our data set run from 42 to 46. All right, so let's pull up the calculator here. And I'm going to pull up the data. I have it sorted in my calculator. And again, if you uh, don't have that data in your calculator, uh, you could put it in yourself and sort it. And I have a video for that. So you can check out the week two material and you'll see a video on how to put this data in and sort it. All right, so I'm just going to be looking right now at the data and determining how many values lie from 42 to 46. All right, so <clears throat> we can count that. So this is one, two, three, four pieces of data. All right, we're just going to continue doing this from 47 to 51. All right, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, so it looks like 11, 52 to 56. So I got one, two, Three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen pieces of data, fifty seven to sixty one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, nine, sixty-two to sixty-six. One, two, three, four, and then finally sixty-seven to seventy-one. So that looks like one, two, three. All right, so now <clears throat> there have been 45 presidents. So what I'd want to do right now is check that I'd miss any data. I mean, I'm counting on my calculator, and you can see how um, tedious that is doing it. It would be much easier, actually, to look at the actual data in here, you know, to, to look at the data in on the PDF and just be able to you know, clearly see it and count it, it would be a lot faster. But since the data was not in order, I was looking at the data sorted in my calculator. So I'm going to add up these frequencies. All right, so 4 plus 11, 14, 9, 4, and 3. All right, so there you go, 45 pieces of data. So I feel pretty good about that. This uh, idea of constructing the frequency table, it never changes. <clears throat> so remember how this works. You start at your lowest piece of data. After you've calculated your class width, which remember, don't forget to use the roundup rule, you consecutively add the class width straight down, creating your lower class limits. Find an upper class limit by using some common sense, then consecutively add the class width straight down to create all your upper class limits. Then once you have those classes created, you can then look at your data and count up the number of values that fall within those classes, and that'll give you your frequency for each class. All right, so one other thing I think we should talk about here. So I'm going to get rid of some stuff. <clears throat> is the class boundaries. 
Now, the class boundaries are used on the histogram. And, you know, a lot of people wonder, what, what are these class boundaries used? Uh, what are they, and how do I find them? You know, in, in other words, why do I even need them? Well, to give you just a quick heads up, if you think about, you know, a bar graph, and, you know, there's a bar here that has a height, and, you know, you think about, you know, this first class, which, you know, this runs from 42 to 46, right? And, you know, in the past, you might have seen this before, you know, in high school or what have you, but from 42 to 46. And, you know, you, you get your next bar, and that next bar, as you can see, runs from 47 to 51. So this is 42 to 46, 47 to 51. And this is where it gets a little weird. This boundary right here. On the one hand, it's the upper boundary for this bar, which is 46. And then on the other hand, it's the lower boundary for this bar, which says it's 47. So we obviously can't call this boundary right here the numbers 46 and 47. So the only common sense thing to do is to extend those boundaries. And that's why we use 46.5. So we define the class boundary as one half of the distance between an upper class limit and the next lower class limit. In other words, it's the middle of those two limits. All right, so in constructing class boundaries, you know, it's easiest to just envision extending the boundaries. So this 42 will back up and become 41.5. And the 46 will extend and become 46.5. So what we're doing is we're increasing the boundaries for each class to close the gaps that would appear between the bars. So for this case, as you can see, I took the 42 and I deducted a half, and then I took the 46 and I increased it by a half. Now, to be honest with you, you don't have to look at the at the rest of the classes again, because once you have these two class boundaries and you want the next class boundary, all you need to do is consecutively add the class width, which remember is 5. So if you add 5 straight down on both of these, you'll create all the class boundaries and you won't even have to look over there. All right, so this would be 46.5. So again, what did I do? I took the 41.5, added 5. I'm going to add 5, add 5, add 5, straight down. All right, so that is going to be 51.5, 56.5, 61.5, All right, and then I'll do the same thing over here, add 5, straight down. And as you'll see, these values here, the class boundaries, will be the labels that we use when we create our histogram. All right, so this video is getting a little long, so what I'll do is I'll create the histogram in a separate video for you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email.